If you brought your Bibles, please open them to um, Psalm 82. Psalm 92, verses 12 through 14 says, The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. And they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. Um, I, I want to ask you today, where will you be in 10 years? Where are you planning to be in 10 years? What's your, Here. Yeah. Here. What's your 10 year plan? How do you plan to keep your life on track for the next 10 years? Um, and is doing the perfect will of God part of that plan? Amen. Yeah, I'm, just, amen. I'm just asking you here. I said, you know, you can, we can have a wishy-washy gospel. We don't actually finish it with you. How many of you have you planned for the will of God to be the center attraction of your life? Work again. If we, I was rereading Deuteronomy 28. We'll get there in a minute. If you are the center of the will of God, your life is good. Amen. Oh, no, that wasn't you. Thank you, oh, Beverly. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> How do you plan to keep your life in the center of the will of God? Go to James chapter 3. We're going to talk today about the power of our words, and I understand a lot of us think we know. But, um, the reason this sermon came out last week, I was telling about how when Gordon had chemo, I had a social worker, God bless her, who absolutely insisted that I agree with her that I wasn't going to have any more kids, but I was fine with it. And, I mean, they can get your face. This, and I wouldn't do it. But I'm so grateful somebody had taught me the authority I have in my words, or I would have done it, and I would have had the answer to that. You establish the will of God for your life. When you need a miracle, your tongue establishes the miracle. Look at James 3, verse 2. It says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So if we want to live pleasing to the Lord, or as perfect as we can, it says nobody's perfect, but if you want to live as perfect as we can, which part should we focus on? Okay, read it with me. I love Okay. For we all, read it with me. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to throw the whole body as well. So if you want to be as perfect as you can, where should you start to focus? On your tongue. Do you know, which, bi which book in the Bible talks the most about wisdom? Proverbs, right. And in the New Testament, it's James, where we are here in the Old Testament, it's Proverbs. I wanted a, a scripture from Proverbs that I knew was in there, so I looked in the, the uh, concordance yesterday. I couldn't believe how... Do you know how many times the New American Standard Bible uses the word mouth in Proverbs? 48 times. Almost 50 times in that little short book, Proverbs talks about your mouth. Mm -hmm. Now what does that tell us? That means that if you're going to be a really wise person, you're going to pay tremendous attention to your mouth. I, I know this is fun. I didn't say it was fun. But, okay, look at verse 3. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their whole body as well. All right. If you're naturally a pugnacious person, you know a pugnacious person likes to fight. Your fists are always in a clench, ready to fight. And you say, you know, I think maybe I ought to change. What do you work on, your fists or your tongue? Your tongue, yeah, you put the bit into your mouth. Verse 4, look at the ships also. Though they are so great and driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. What does a rudder do to a ship? We just read it. It steers it. What does the steering wheel do to your truck or your van or your car? It steers it. What does your tongue do to your life? If you want to stay in the perfect will of God, how do you do it? You do what Jesus said. You steer your life into the perfect will of God. I'm going to show you one scripture after another where he said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. I came to seek and save the lost. I didn't come to do And he said, this doesn't sound like fun. Okay. How many of you would honestly say that for the next 10 years of your life, you really want to be in the epicenter of the will of God? Yeah, and the reason I, I don't even know if I point out to you, the reason we went to Psalm 92, what did it say about their old age? They'd still be bearing fruit. 
I know a lot of people, they think, well, if I'm over 55, I've done my, I've raised my kids, I've done my work, this is fun time. You can have some fun, but you better do it happen to the will of God. Because the will of God continues your whole life here. Verse 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. If you really want a successful life, where does your focus have to be? On taming your tongue, on directing your tongue, and to using it proactively to get where you want to go. Amen. How central is your mouth into getting where you're going in life? Like I said, if you go to Proverbs, you can get a concordance out. 48 times the word mouth. That does not count all the times it uses tongue. It doesn't count all the time it uses words. Just the word mouth is addressed 48 times in Proverbs. Jesus steered his life straight into the purposes and plan of God every word he spoke. Look at, I've got script, um, four scriptures I'd like you to read with me. John 6, 38 is the first one. Read it with me. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Maybe you were born in Colonial Beach. You can say, I was born in Colonial Beach, Virginia, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And he said, what difference does it make what I say? Your, your tongue steers you. It steers your heart. It steers your will. It steers your focus. <coughs> Next, do you see how Jesus did? How many of you are incredibly, wonderfully glad that Satan was not able to push him off track? Yeah. Okay, next scripture. Read this with me. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So he said, I'd rather do the will of God than have a good meal. Now he had some good meals. He enjoyed some good meals, but doing the will of God was his real food. Mark 10, 45. Read this with me. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for men. Now understand, in a way, this doesn't look fun. Unless, the place that this steers you to is a place better than any place you've ever been in life. Yeah. Okay? Amen. One more scripture where he used his, his mouth to get where he was going. Luke 19.10. Read it with me. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So all day, every day, you just can read it. I just took four sample scriptures where he said, I didn't come to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Amen? I didn't come to be served, but to serve. I came to seek and save the lost. He kept his life exactly in the center of the lane. God had it for him by saying what the Father said about him. Now, I have to tell you, if you get in the center of the will of God, you're going to be out of death. If you, you tell me how bad the center of the will of God sounds. If you get in the center of the will of God, you're going to have a great marriage. Center of the will of God, you will have excellent physical health and excellent emotional health. Amen. If you get in the very center of the will of God, the glory of God will defend you, your loved ones, and your reputation. Amen. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? The devil tells all of us, ooh, you don't want the will of God. How do you know? Of course, look at Deuteronomy 28.1. I want to try to convince you that you want to seek the perfect will of God for your life for the next 10 years, and I don't care what age you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Read this with me. Now it shall be, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will do what? You think he meant it? Yeah. The center of the will of God is for you to be promoted. And if you read the next 14 verses, we may do it at the end. I know I didn't give you that scripture. But it says you'll be blessed coming in and blessed going out. Your kids will be blessed and your cattle will be blessed. I mean, you cannot find a time in your day that you're not blessed if you're in the center of the will of God. And so today we're going to talk about the power of our words. I understand you may know something about this. There's not one person here, including me, nobody completely gets the fact that the authority of death and life are in our mouths. Okay? I know last week when I said I wouldn't say that God, Christiana would never be born or that I'd never have kids. Some people here, I don't know if they, maybe they were busy, but some people here didn't understand. I knew that. You really need to get the fact that death and life, this is Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of your tongue. And if you love it and pay attention to it, you're going to eat the fruit thereof. Go to Genesis 1. One day God wanted a family and he wanted the perfect planet for them to live on. 
So he got out his hammer and his saw and his level. Is that what he did? No. I like what Keith Moore says about that. When a king wants a ditch dug, he doesn't look for a shovel. <laughs> Say that with me. When a king wants a ditch dug, he doesn't look for a shovel. What does he do? He says, go to get a ditch right there. Yeah. He says it. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean, ladies, we don't clean our bathrooms. <laughs> Some things you do. But let me tell you something. Where you're going in life, if you want to get there, you'll do it with the words of man. Amen. So let's just review what happened here. Genesis 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Now, was this what God wanted? A formless and dark, void earth? No. no. The Spirit of God was moving over the face of the surface of the waters. What was he doing? He was waiting for the words to go forth so he could fulfill it. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 6, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the, wa from the waters. Verse 9, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and days and years. Verse, verse 20, then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. Verse 24. And then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. In verse 26, the Lord said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Well, let's pause right there. He said, let us, this is a reference to the Trinity way back in Genesis 1. Let us make men in our image and according to our likeness. Is God a speaking spirit? Yes. 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 Tremendous power in his mouth. Amen. Did he create you a speaking spirit? Amen. Yeah, a parrot can hear what you say and regurgitated across his vocal cord, but there's no authority there because he's not a speaking spirit. Only man was made in the image of God to have authority. What did the Lord do when he wanted to create heavens and earth? He spoke precisely what he wanted in that order. Look at Hebrews 11.3. It talks about the creation of heaven and earth. I know for some of this, this is us. This is complete review, but I don't know about you, but I need it. Because yeah. if you don't remind yourself of how powerful your words are, you will say some dumb stuff. Yeah. You get on Twitter and find out how many people don't know how much. People have gotten great jobs and blown it on Twitter through a vulgar tweet the next day. Now, how stupid is that? People don't know the power of their words. Now, read this with me. It's in, in, in the great faith chapter. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of the things which are visible. We could have read it this way. It's we understand by faith. It could be able to translate this, but we understand by faith that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made of the invisible. It wasn't made of nothing. People say God made the earth out of nothing. No, he didn't. He used a spiritual substance called faith. And it came from that parent realm into this realm. Okay, it wasn't made out of nothing. God created all that we know in this physical world, world with words. Are his words some of the most powerful spiritual entities we know anything about? Yes. There's very few ways that we relate to the spiritual world, to be honest, okay? Words is one of them. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life in John chapter 6. The Bible says that even now, all the reality we know is being held together by the Word of God. That was Hebrews 11.3. Now let's look at Hebrews 1.3. Read this with me. And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the Word of His power. And then we'll stop there. It goes on to another subject. He upholds everything right now. That If you ask scientists, they say, we really don't know what keeps the atom together. It's the Word of God. Hallelujah. So my point, and we're going to look, if you want to be turning to Genesis chapter 25. My point is this. The reason you have authority in your mouth is twofold. Number one, because you were made in His image and you are a speaking spirit. The power in your mouth. 
The other thing is, and we'll go back to it later, but in verse 28, he said, let them have dominion. We need to explain what you have dominion over. You have dominion over your sphere of influence. If you're a parent, you have a lot of spiritual authority over your kids. You have authority over your body. You do not have a dominion over whether I do the will of God. Only you, okay, but you have authority over whether you do the will of God. Amen. You do not have a right to cross other people's will. You can't pray, God, make my mother-in-law move to Arizona. <laughs> Are you following me then? That's witchcraft. When we start praying, I, I'm just, I've seen people take Mark 11, 23, where, where Jesus said, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, cast in the sea, and it will be done to you. And they say, okay, fine. And they start saying, who's going to marry who? Duh. Okay. Understand. Yeah, you got to understand. And then if it doesn't happen, they say, well, Mark 11, 23 doesn't work. You didn't understand the scripture. All right. Number one, you should always pray for the will of God in any marriage, anywhere, anytime. Yeah, yeah. Don't let any kid get married without praying for him. God, have your way, and if it's wrong, show him. Yes. Yes. Pray that over everybody. If they're 55, thinking of getting married, pray the same thing. I'm just saying, it's too important. It's too big of a covenant. All right, so what were we talking about? We are talking <laughs> about the fact, first of all, all right, you have a sphere of influence. In, in, in Romans, Paul talks about my sphere of influence. He said, I'd really like to go preach there as far as my sphere of influence. So God has given us a sphere of influence here in Colonial Beach and in Mexico. He opened that door. And we're able to use our spiritual authority there. We're not trying to run their lives. They each have pastors. But we're still trying to use our influence to help them receive the word of God just as much as possible. You and your husband... Join spheres of influence when you got married. It says that her body is yours and your body is his. Or, you know what I mean? Or, but but go, goes both ways. Yeah. You have tremendous authority in prayer when you're getting along. If you're fighting, not so much. That's because the power is in the agreement. And if there's no agreement, then you have to get yourself worked out and loving on each other and forgiving up, and then your agreement works again. <laughs> but here's my deal. I couldn't get my husband's seal. And he said, why are you talking to us about this? Well, it's just one example I looked through. He was ready to go home. He was tired. He had been so disrespected in the ministry. We were just, we, and we had been in a, in a storefront for 17 years. And that's not considered a successful church. You're supposed to get a storefront for a couple years, get a building. We were doing good to stay alive, weren't we, Bill? You remember, thank you, you always went to Amen Corner. Well, we were here, and we were getting people saved. I said, honey, you, he was on his deathbed, and he just, he had zero. He did not fight to live. The first time he did in 1990, he did. We fought in scriptures. We were triumphant. We had another 10, 11 good years. We had a baby, Christiana. And the second time, he was done with cancer. Right. He was done with the ministry. He thought he wouldn't have told you. He'd have been so sweet. But, I mean, we'd given people a shirt off our backs. We helped tons of people in benevolence that were making twice as much as we were because we knew how to be frugal and they didn't. We tried to help. I'm not saying, I'm not the place. Sounds like I'm whining. I'm not. I'm just saying he was tired of it. And I thought I could make him stay. I thought I could guilt him into it. You got babies. No, that's his spirit. Of I could not make him get healed. I cannot promise you that you can get every single person you ever pray for healed. You can a lot of times if they're in agreement, but you're not going to shove healing off on anybody. No. You're never going to shove the baptism of the Holy Spirit off on anybody. Yeah. You'll not even sh shove salvation. God won't send, shove salvation on anybody. But because when he made us, he, he made us sacred in our free will. Right. He enormously respects our free will. But what I want to talk to you about today is where you can use your authority. But at the same time, I want you to understand, you don't pray for your mother-in-law to move to Arizona. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. We see, we all get that. We all get that. Is there anybody here that doesn't get that? Yeah, we all get that. All right. Oh, we better move on. All right. All right. We are going to look in Genesis at a complicated story. Parents are not supposed to have favorites, but in this case, a mom and a dad had twin sons, and they favored each favored one. The dad favored Esau, and the mom favored Jacob. And the other thing I want to remind you of is that in those days, it was extremely important who came out of the womb first, because the firstborn received twice the inheritance of all the other siblings. Like if, if, if there were five siblings, you divided it six ways. 
the firstborn got a twofold, and then the other four got each got a part. And if you were the firstborn, like um, this was the first child that Rebecca and Isaac had, then he would also be the patriarch of the family, so it was really important. Let's just start reading here in Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. Hallelujah. Now these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abram's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah. That's important because we're going to see in a minute that he was 60 when he had the twins. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, of Aramean, of Paddan, Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. This is after 20 years of barrenness. And you say, why? Because if you look down to verse 26, if you've got your Bible open, it says he was 60 when the twins were born. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, let me ask you this. Did he have authority in his mouth? Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anywhere that he ever prayed before then. He prayed one prayer, as far as we can tell. And she can see. So he had a lot of authority in his mouth. Now let's pick up on the next verse. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? And so she went to inquire of the Lord. The real quick question Did Rebecca have a relationship with the Lord? Yeah. Did she have such a good relationship that she expected to get answers? Yeah. Should she be an example for us? Yeah. yeah, you ought to be able to inquire of the Lord and hear from God. Verse 23 The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So what does she know right away about the twins? Even though the second one comes out second, he's going to be the one in charge. The older will serve the younger. Now let's just read verse uh, for a while here. It's a story we know of it. Verse 24, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel, so his name was Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. Rebecca loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff, therefore I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, I'm about to die. So of what use is the birthright? Now as I said before, he missed, he missed lunch. He had had breakfast. Miss lunch honey, and he's about to die. Now, <laughs> oh, come on, we've all been there. I don't think I can live another hour unless I find whatever restaurant you want. All right. Can you see a birthright? No. Can you eat a birthright? How important are words? A birthright is basically words. It's a contractual agreement that says you get double of the stuff and you're the patriarch. How much respect did Esau have for words? Was he carnally minded? Yes. Was his grandfather Abraham carnally minded? No. He left He left Ur on a promise. I'll make you a great nation. He had all, He left Everything and everything he ever knew except for Lot on a promise. Right. Abraham was carnally minded, or excuse me, spiritually minded. <clears throat> Esau was carnally minded, and the Lord said, I won't have that person, the head of my nation. Yeah. We need to respect words because that's where the spiritual forces are. Right. I want to take just one second here. You probably know this. You have to understand your words are containers. Yeah. And if you were dying in the middle of the Sahara Desert, I could pour water into the glass and hand it to you and save your life. But I could also pour strychnine to you in it. Is that a liquid? I think it is. Anyhow, hand it to you and kill you. Because you see, the glass, it wouldn't be the glass's fault. That's just a container. You have had people speak words to you that just brought comfort and strength to your whole day. And you've also had somebody that you thought you could trust and your heart was wide open to them say something hateful and derisive. I and mean, just every bit of strength went out of you. So you have to understand the reason God has so much respect for words is they are spiritual containers. They carry spiritual forces, including faith. You can put on belief. You know, when they didn't go into the promised land, they said, you brought us out here in this desert to kill us, God. 
and they put poison and unbelief in it. It killed their future. Yeah. They tramped for 40 years. Or you can put faith in your words. Hallelujah. Now, mm. I, I'm getting off track, but I just want to don't, not forget to say this. You can say, well, I can't prove I'm healed. You don't have to say, prove you're healed. You don't have to say you're healed. Say, I believe I'm healed. Yeah. I believe I'm going to stay in track of the perfect will of God. Say, I believe. You can always do that. You have a right. Does that make sense? All right, so where do we start off? 32, 33. And Jacob said, first swear to me. And so he swore to him and sold his birthright to him. You see, we don't see that as a big deal, but that is just a travesty. It's almost like blasphemy to despise something God gave him like that. 34. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil soup, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way, and thus Esau despised his birthright. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to fast forward a number of years, go to Genesis 27. We're going to read some scripture today. I'm not going to hold you past 12. But I want you to see how much Isaac... Now, was Isaac spiritual or not spiritual? He was spiritual. Very spiritual. Abraham was spiritual. Isaac was spiritual. Jacob was spiritual. Esau was... Man, you just don't want to be there, do you? You don't want to be the idiot that can't see. <laughs> it should say, when you go to heaven and sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, it should have said that. But he was so dense. I just don't want to be dense about spiritual things. Amen. All right, starting in chapter 27, verse 1. Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see, they called his older son Esau and said, My son, and he said, Here I am. And Isaac said, Behold, now I am old and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver, your bow, go out to the field and cut game for me. Prepare a savory dish for me that I love and bring it to me that I may eat so that my soul may bless you before I die. Verse 5, Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke to his son. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring it home, if you know the story, she tells Jacob to just go get a kid instead of, well, and prepare it. Let's start at verse 9. She says, make a savory dish for your father such as he loves, and then you shall bring it to your father, that he may eat it, that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, and said, Behold, Esau, my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will... Feel me, and then I will be as a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. Now watch what she says. But his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. Now, we would say, No big deal. Your curse will be upon me. If there was a curse associated with the deception, it went on Rebecca, just like she said. Yeah. I'm trying to get you to see how extremely important yeah. words are. Because within 24 hours of her doing this, Jacob is running for his life, and she never sees him alive again. Yeah. 20 years later, he comes home, and Isaac's still living. You know, the guy thought he was going to die that day, so he was going to give the bus. He's still alive, yeah. and Rebecca is dead. Wow. You don't take curses lightly. If somebody, you say, what if I know somebody's trying to put a curse at me? Then you just stand your ground and say, the blood of Jesus is against you. Yeah. But you don't pretend they don't exist, all right? Okay, we're going to skip down to verse 16. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. She also gave the savory food and the bread which she had made to her son Jacob. And then he came to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please sit, and eat of my game that you may bless me. Now, this is a complicated story. I heard Al Fury preach it this one day. And he said, in a sense, he was Esau because in matters of the birthright and the blessing, they were sold to him. But this, and I agree with him on that in a way. Do you understand? He, Esau sold all right to be firstborn at that point. But at the same time, I believe that because God had told Rebecca the younger will serve the older, if she had stood in faith, I think there was a different way for Jacob yeah. to get the blessing. Because if you look here, he does sow deception big time. And do you know what happens as soon as he gets married? He's married to the wrong woman. Who ever heard of such a thing? You wake up and you say, I do, and you get the wrong I never heard that anywhere in all history. That's pretty big deception, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, not the one you want. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Okay, this is my. Uh, this is complicated, but I do believe that he would have been the first. You know, the young, older would have served the younger. Either way, there was a better way to go at this. But anyhow, it wasn't a complete lie. Verse twenty-two. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, "The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau." 
He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, and so he blessed them. Verse 27, he came close and kissed him, and when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field the Lord is blessed. So he feels his voice is like Jacob's, but he smells like Esau. He stinks. Verse 20, <laughs> now may God, let's enter the blessing. Now may God give you the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and the abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers. And may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. Now, Americans in 2018 would think, well, that's like a nice toast to the wedding. <laughs> but you know what? He doesn't treat it like a nice toast to the wedding. He treats it like God said, let there be light. That's how you've got to treat your words. That's how much authority they have. Let's keep reading verse 30. Now it came about, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. And then he also made savory food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to him, who are you? And he said, I'm your son, your first point, you saw. And then Isaac trembled violently and said, who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I eat all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. Now let me ask you something. How much? Did Isaac believe in the authority of his words? Verse 34, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceeding great bitter and bitter cry, saying, and said to his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, your, your brother came and deceitfully and taken away your blessing. And then he said, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times and took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. And he says, haven't you reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau. Now I want you to read this with me because look how he says it here. Read it. Behold, I have made him your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants. And with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Now what I want you to see is how drastically different their view of faith-filled, faith-spoken words is than ours. Now listen to how we would do this in 2018. We'd say, oh, did I say that? Oh, no big deal. Cancel it out and we'll start over. Anybody got the white out? Somebody press rewind. Cut, cut, take two. Yeah. Pull it over. We figure I'll lose my temper today and say all kinds of horrible things, but I'll fix it up tomorrow. All this is to ask one question. What would Isaac have that kind of, why would Isaac have that kind of generation-changing, world-changing power? He said, I just made him your master, God. That's how we should feel when we said, we pray, and we say, by stripes, you're healed. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Amen. That's the kind of authority we have. And we need to know it. Amen. Why would Isaac have, number two, I already gave this away, but number one is that Isaac was made in the exact image of God. We reflect his image. Within your sphere of influence. You see, over this church you have influence. You know why? Because you're part of us. Did you know that you're, I know, it's supposed to just be you. I thought, I don't want to worry about church either. I just want to worry about me. <laughs> But you know what? If we're going to fulfill the will of God, we're going to have to start using our faith for the destiny of the church. Yeah. And I need help. <laughs> we are made in the image of God. If we want to do the perfect will of God for our lives, there isn't anybody anywhere that can stop us. Amen. I'll show it to you in a minute. You know, Jesus said, how do you pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Come your kingdom, be done your will. And it says in the book of 1 John, if anybody prays anything according to his will, you can't stop it. It's done. So that one prayer will get your life farther forward than any prayer in the world is to say today and for the next 10 years. You say, why for the next 10 years? I can't look beyond 10 years. I don't want to. But for today and for the next 10 years, your highest will be done in my life. Do you realize that we are God's fellow workers? 
we'll get there in just one second. Genesis 126, you remember what it says, he made us in his image. Now, the Bible says that he has lightning coming out of the ends of his fingers. I haven't seen any lightning come out of your fingers or anything. But you do have the ability to speak words. You can bless your kids. I bless my kids. I told you, I received them never walking away from God. The month before Nathan was conceived, Norval Hayes was in a church. I just like to tell this story because it reminds me of the times I've taken my faith and thrown it out into the future and said, there it is. Deal with it, devil. Yeah. You say you wouldn't do that. I'll bet I would. Yeah, but Norval Hayes called all the mamas that had kids away from God, so I couldn't go forward legitimately on that altar call. So I'm sitting in my career praying for my sisters. It's almost all women up there. Oh, God, bring the babies back. And the Lord said, why are you just sitting here? I said, I'm done. I pray for my sister. And all he said, why aren't you taking your faith and throwing it out into the future so that your children will never walk away from God one day in their life? And as he said it, I grabbed it. I had a car run over my legs once. This is really embarrassing. I have to love when they tell you some of these stories. Bill and Karen had one of the oldest cars known to men. God, they weren't their fault. <laughs> So we had just got the old, the old white man that we just got rid of. We just got that, and it was new. And they need to take kids somewhere. And they said, do you mind if we take the youth group somewhere? And so we had their old. And the, the key was in the car. What am I telling you? <laughs> I thought, it's very irresponsible for me to leave that key. It's out back at our house. Do you know how private our house is? Nobody was ever going to touch it. I had to get the key out. I fiddled with it and started. I'm not in the car. I'm leaning in through an empty, uh, uh, open window. And the thing started going across that empty lot that they just built a house on. Now, long story short, it went over my legs. And as I see this huge, heavy old car, it, wasn't, it was old, but it wasn't light. It was a big, heavy old car running over my legs. I think I've got an 18-month-old child and two broken legs. And as I'm thinking this thought, what, my, what about my baby and two broken legs? A scripture I had memorized many years before from Psalm 34 says he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. It just charged out of me. I, I know it was the Holy Spirit speaking it. And here's the deal. It was meant prophetically over Jesus, but do you understand that every single scripture is so full of life? It will do just about anything you believe it to do. Amen. It's hard to take a scripture so far out of context. It doesn't work. And as I felt that scripture come out of me, I grabbed it. I literally felt my heart grab it. I described it to Dallas later, and he said, that's what happened, honey, because you were just a scripture. Yeah. No, I'm saying this. I didn't even have time that day to say, not a leg, not a bone of me is broke. I have time. I grabbed it. Right. We need to take this word so seriously that we chart our lives by it. Amen. And we direct the course of our lives. We need to say what Jesus said. I didn't come here to do my will. I have come to do the will of the one who sent me. And you say, oh, I don't know about that. Well, read Deuteronomy 28 and see how you like it. I Okay. Man, I mean, we honest. Let's just quit. <laughs> when I was 22, I did not want to do the will of God. And for all you kids, I'm not proud of it, all right? But I didn't trust you. I thought I could design a better life than God could. And now, having brilliantly done things my own way in my early 20s and finding out how really unpleasant that is, I just want to tell you, the only thing I want this year is the will of God. We're trying to make decisions in Mexico about dates for next year. Whether Pastor Jose is ready to take on our sister because there's so many. We're making this. All I want is the will of God. And you say, why? Because I finally, a few years later, learned that you can trust the will of God to be smarter than you are. If you can stay in the will of God, you've got it made. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9. It says that we are God's help, fellow workers. We are God's fellow workers. Now, how are you going to work with God this year? We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. He says, how do you work with God? You work with God by agreeing with God. You work with God by when you pray for the church. I hope you pray for the church. Because what we're trying to bust through on this land and move forward is bigger than one person's prayers. We really need to be praying. I know Mr. Morgan, you pray all the time. Yeah, I'm not preaching you. <laughs> if I go visit him, we never leave without thanking God for the land for the Bible college. You say, what Bible college? 
I know as well as, I can't say there will be a Bible college here. But I promise you, if God gets his way, there will be a Bible college here. Oh, never, I was, they asked me to sign the diplomas for the Biblical Instituto Biblico de Rueda. So I'm signing 43 diplomas. I think it was Dave. Somebody asked me, does it feel funny to be signing those diplomas? I said, no, it doesn't. Feel, it's the only thing I feel funny about, I always thought I'd sign the English ones first. Yeah. That's what's so weird. I never dreamed the Spanish Bible college would come before the English one. What we're trying to bust through here is bigger than one person's faith and words. It's like, I'm, I'm soliciting your help to say everything that God ever intended for this church will happen. Yeah. It will yeah. stay in the will of God. We will have the land that we need. We will have the right Bible college professors when that time comes. And we will raise up and send out kids Hallelujah. to the ends of the earth. Yeah. I always thought the <laughs> we are told to choose our words in order to fulfill our destiny and in order to bless and help our fellow man. Matthew 6, 9 to 10. And I think I'm going to put a list of scriptures up. If you don't take it, I don't have it today. But if you don't take them, I'm not going to be mad. But I believe we need to speak the will of God over our life. Because if we don't get aggressive about this, we've got an aggressive enemy. We've got an enemy that says, land's ours. Demonic spirits walk down on us. We're going to have to get after and say, I don't care what you say. The will of God is that this land come into the kingdom and will come into the kingdom. And it's going to take our knowing. Just like Isaac said, it's too late. I just made him your master. Yeah. It's too late. Yeah. That's right. Look at Matthew 6, 9. Jesus taught us to pray. Pray them in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Read the next verse with me. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every time you pray that prayer, you pray for healing. Every time you pray that prayer, you pray for over-the-top abundance finances. Because in, in heaven, they, they pay the, the streets with gold. Everything about this prayer is to bring heaven into your life. Hallelujah. Now let me show you that other one I promised too. In 1 John 5, we want to read 14 to 15. John says this. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Just pause. I'm not trying to talk down to you, but think with me. Is there anything you could ask more perfectly according to the will of God than the will of God? Think about that. Is there anything you could ask more that you know is the will of God more perfectly than to ask for the will of God? I mean, that's... I know it sounds like I'm talking down to you. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask for the will of God, which is according to his will, he hears us. Yeah. Verse next verse. Read it with me. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Hallelujah. Jesus came to this earth absolutely determined that he was going to do the will of God, qualified to go to the cross, Go to the cross, get through the cross without asking to come down off the cross. Do you know how many things he had to believe for? I'm, I can't fathom it. Doesn't it make you admire him? I just. Yeah. He has no equal. He has nobody that compares with him. God wants us to be that determined to do the will of God. Now, this is what Satan always tells you when you decide, I'm going to help that church do the will of God. We're going to pray this through. You're thinking that it'll cost you because you're not going after what you want. Go to Deuteronomy 28. I know we got five minutes. Go to Deuteronomy. This describes the highest perfect will of God if God could have his druthers in your life. Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God. Would that be the highest will of God for your life? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Being careful to do all the commandments which I command you. Everything tells you to do this year. Would that be the highest will of God for your life? Yeah. yeah. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Now read the rest with me. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you do the perfect will of God for your life. I'm just going to say it that way, okay? Next verse. So read it with me. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body, and the produce of your ground, and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall you be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. How many of you can handle this? 
Amen. You know, just, just plenty of blessings. Will you share with everybody else? Next verse, read it with me. The Lord shall cause your enemies to rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and will flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns, that's your bank accounts, and in all that you put your hand to. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God in his ways. So all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will be afraid of you. They'll treat you with respect. Next verse. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the offspring of your body, in the offspring of your beasts, and in the produce of your ground, in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse the heavens to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the works of your hand, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will only be above, and you will not be underneath, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today, to observe them carefully. And do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. So what have I tried to say to you? This is a description of the perfect will of God. If they'd stay in the Garden of Eden, that's all they have is blessing, respect, honor, great relationships. God came, or Lord Jesus came to put that all back. But we receive that when we pursue his will, and we pursue his will with our words. I hope you got something out of it. Your words are tremendously Amen. important. Amen.